Hello and welcome to my channel. This is a new course that I'm starting called the MBBS Flash Dash, which is mainly aimed at final year medical students who need a quick revision before their finals. In this video, I will be starting part 1 of the ophthalmology series. Do check out the links below in the description if you want written notes from my website and also flashcards which I've uploaded on Pinterest. So let's get started. In this video, we will be covering anterior uveitis, diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy, central retinal artery occlusion or CRAO, central retinal vein occlusion or CRVO, cataract and also conjunctivitis. The first one, anterior uveitis, also known as iritis and iridocyclitis, is the inflammation of the anterior portion of the uvea. So uvea consists of iris, ciliary body, and also the choroid. It usually presents as a unilateral symptom, so only one eye is affected, and it starts spontaneously without history of trauma or any precipitating events. The clinical features are dull, aching, painful red eye, ciliary flush or photophobia, blurred vision, and even lacrimation, so some tears may come up. So some signs to take note of is the presence of cells and flares in the anterior chamber, and the pupil may be irregular. So in this case, if you were to view both eyes, since it presents unilaterally, meaning only one side, the affected eye as you can see here, it's not normal. It's not the normal circular shape, whereas the non-affected eye will appear normal. So the pupil may be irregular, like in this case, it's not normal. It's distorted, can be constricted, and also sluggish to react. So some associated conditions to take note of would be ankylosing spondylitis, reactive arthritis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease or even association with HLA B27. Now the management would be steroids and cycloplegic midriatic medications. So it consists of prednisolone eye drops, that's the steroid part, to reduce inflammation and also cyclopentolate or atropine drops. But the function of both these medication is it will paralyze the ciliary muscles, the muscles in the eye, and it will cause the pupils to dilate. This will prevent adhesion between the lens and the iris as well as to help relieve pain and photophobia. As you know, cyclopentolate is a form of cycloplegic. So what happens is, is the cyclopentolate will dilate the pupil. And this is important, as I mentioned, to prevent the adhesion and to relieve the pain and photophobia. Diabetic retinopathy. There are a few types to take note of for diabetic retinopathy. You have non-proliferative retinopathy, otherwise known as background retinopathy, and the next would be pre-proliferative retinopathy, followed by proliferative retinopathy. All right, so in non-proliferative retinopathy or background retinopathy, you would see dots, blots, and hard exudates. That's how I remember for exams. Um, dots, blots, hard exudates. Now the dots, of course, would be microaneurysms. And blots would be hemorrhages and also formation of hard exudates, as you can see in the pictures here. So microaneurysm over here, and then hemorrhages, you'll see blood spots, and also formation of hard exudates. For the first part, it's just dot blots and hard exudates, and that will be present for all. But as you progress, take note of the red colored ones so these are the new ones that will form in the following progression so after non-proliferative would be the pre-proliferative retinopathy so of course like i mentioned before you have dots blots hard exudates but in this case there would be cotton wool spots following that would be proliferative retinopathy you have dots, blots, and hard exudates as well as cotton wool spots. So the cotton wool spots come from the pre-proliferative retinopathy phase. The new part here would be new vascularization and new vascularization stands for new vessel formation. And the treatment in this phase would be laser photocoagulation. Basically, once you see the term new vascularization, it is proliferative retinopathy. And in this case, like I mentioned, you need laser photocoagulation because if you do not treat the patient in this proliferative phase, 
um, they may progress rapidly to blindness. Hypertensive retinopathy. So in diabetic retinopathy, it's caused by uncontrolled um, diabetes mellitus. In hypertensive retinopathy, it is caused by uncontrolled hypertension. In hypertensive retinopathy, there is macular edema, hard exudates, dots, as I mentioned before, dots are microaneurysms, bloods are hemorrhages. Now the part here would be anterior venous nipping. Uh, that's what differentiates diabetic retinopathy from hypertensive retinopathy. In hypertensive retinopathy, you have arterial venous nipping. And what does it mean is that, um, as you can see in this picture over here, there is a crossing between the artery and the vein. This is um, bad because it will result in the compression of the vein bulging on either side of the crossing. As you can see, this is a normal AV crossing, all right? and the artery is rather small and then this is followed by the vein but in hypertensive retinopathy the artery will be bulging and in this case you see if when they cross each other this is bad because it will compress the vein and when the vein is being compressed you will see bulging on either side whereas over here it's just um, constant the size is constant there's also copper or silver wiring and flame shaped hemorrhage now the treatment for this would be just to control the hypertension because hypertensive retinopathy, as I said, is due to uncontrolled hypertension. Central retinal artery occlusion or CRAO. It is sudden, occurs over seconds, painless unilateral loss of vision and no eye redness. Take note, no eye redness. It is acute painless loss of vision. So it's just important to know the anatomy a little bit because this may come out in MCQ. Central retinal artery is a branch of the ophthalmic artery and the ophthalmic artery is a branch of the internal carotid artery. Now in this case, the patient may have history of amaurosis fugax in the past or may be associated with giant cell arthritis, also known as temporal arthritis. So if you were to do a fundoscopy, you would observe pale or white retina, vessels attenuation, and also cherry red spots on macula. So this is the cherry red spot. It is important to take note of um, the findings of the fundoscopy because in exam, they may ask you to type out what you see as well as come up with the diagnosis. And it's important to differentiate between central retinal artery occlusion and central retinal vein occlusion. So I'll talk about that a bit more in the next slide. So as you can see here, the background is pale or white, okay? And then you will notice a cherry red spot over here. Now the management would be firm ocular massage to try and dislodge the occlusion or clot within 90 minutes of the presentation of symptom followed by referral. This is central retinal vein occlusion or CRVO. It is unilateral, painless loss of vision or blurred vision there would be image distortion and also visual field defect. If you were to do a fundoscopy, you would notice dot, blood, and flame hemorrhages. As you can see, there's dots, blood, and flame hemorrhages, and the background is red. There is also macular edema. So take note of the presentation between CRVO and CRAO. In CRVO, vein occlusion, the background is red, and you see flame hemorrhages. Whereas in CRAO, the background is white or pale, followed by a cherry red macula spot over here. The management would be pan-retinal photocoagulation or intravitreal anti-VEGF, but the preferred would be pan-retinal photocoagulation. So here, just to take note between CRAO and CRVO. So in CRAO, central retinal artery occlusion, the background is pale, pale retina, with cherry red macula and there's also vessels attenuation in crvo central retinal vein occlusion there are hemorrhages you can see here flame hemorrhages and also engorged tortuous veins as well as macular edema cataract usually occurs in the old age but sometimes cataract can present after a child is born after a baby is born so congenital cataract is caused by rubella but usually, if a person were to present with cataract, it's usually during the old age. So the presentation of symptom, they will usually have gradually decreased vision, glare, especially at night, 
so the lights will appear brighter than usual dazzling halos around the lights and the patient may or may not have use of steroids prolonged use of steroids so um, if the patient is suffering from COPD or asthma or even other um, disease where they are required to use steroids for long periods of time this may be a side effect cataract sometimes increased exposure to UV um, such as going out and being under the sun for prolonged periods of time over time without protection without sunglasses it may also be caused by eye trauma any trauma to the eye other risk factors would be uncontrolled diabetes and smoking as well as high myopia so in that time, if you see the word hellos like the patient sees hellos okay you think of cataract or acute angle closure glaucoma it will be either one but then of course you need to read the question stem and see which one um what are the other presenting clinical features that's how you rule out after that so the management would be extracapsular lens extraction followed by intraocular lens implantation basically you see this part here it becomes white you were to remove it and insert a new lens conjunctivitis so conjunctivitis can be divided into viral conjunctivitis bacterial conjunctivitis as well as allergic conjunctivitis so let's start with viral in viral conjunctivitis there is redness usually and no pain and no discharge and even if there is discharge it's usually watery and serious discharge it's basically just plain okay and it affects the preauricular region preauricular region is outside the ear at the side of the face there will also be lymphadenopathy presentation so if you were to palpate along the the lymph nodes along the face to the chin so it may be enlarged there are no vision impairment and it's most commonly due to upper respiratory tract infection the most common organism would be adenovirus so the treatment for viral conjunctivitis would be reassurance and supportive treatment basically just tell the patient that it will go away it's caused by virus and supportive treatment would be cold presses and artificial tears bacterial conjunctivitis now bacterial conjunctivitis this is how it presents usually there there would be discharge and the discharge is usually very thick you can see it's prominent and when a patient wakes up the eyes may be stuck together like if you've experienced bacterial conjunctivitis before you would know this when you wake up in the morning like what's that sticking and when you open your eyes it's a bit hard or basically you need to wet your eyelashes for a bit or even your eyes and then you can open it fully patient may or may not have history of otitis media so otitis media is inflammation of the middle ear the initial treatment would be self clear clean the discharge using cotton wool cotton wool soaked in water now if um, it were to be prolonged for more than two weeks and it does not cure the first line treatment would be chloramphenicol and fusidic acid but usually you do not give anything um, as mentioned here it's just self-care clean the discharge and it will go away but if it's more than two weeks that's when you need to go for intervention with antibiotics the last would be allergic conjunctivitis so allergic conjunctivitis it's bilateral because it's due to allergies so it affects both eyes okay and there is itching as well as chemosis chemosis is the swelling of conjunctiva with or without the eyelids the discharge would be serious similar presentation to viral conjunctivitis but the patient may have history of atopy and seasonal variation because it's allergic maybe the patient may have asthma ask about allergic rhinitis they may have if the patient comes in with bilateral um, redness of the eye so to differentiate it between viral and allergic it's good to ask about history of atopy and seasonal variation now the treatment would be topical antihistamines because it's allergic you need to give antihistamines to control it and also avoidance of allergen such as dust pads carpets like that all right so if you've reached this part of the video thank you so much for watching do hit the subscribe button and press like on this video because it really encourages me to continue and press the notification bell so you don't miss out on any new videos i post videos weekly 
and see you in the next one